Um, hello, everybody. I'm um, some moderator, guest speakers. I'm Harris. I'll be your MC for today. Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin, a few reminders for housekeeping. Please mute your audio and video throughout the session so that we will have a smooth session. At the end of the forum, we will have a photography session for all invited speakers, panelists, and invited guests. Should you have any questions during the session, you can introduce yourself and post the question in the chat box. Kindly fill in the attendance form in which the link will be provided in the chat box. Respected guest speakers for today, Mr. Stephen D. Matthias, the Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, United Nations Office of Legal Affairs, Dr. Nilufa Oral, the Director of the Center for International Law and Senior Fellow of the National University of Singapore, member of the UN International Law Commission and the IUCN World Conservation Congress Elections Officer. Respected moderator, our very own Professor Dato Dr. Rahmat Muhammad, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Professor of International Law of University Technology Mara, IUCF, World Conservation Congress Elections Officer. Um, apologies, IUCN World Conservation Congress Deputy Elections Officer and member of the Eminent Person Group of ALCO. Professor Christoph Antons, UITM Law Visiting Professor, Professor Emeritus Stephen Freeland, UITM Law External Examiner, Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Panglima Richard Malanjum, Adjunct Professor of UITM Law, Respected Deans and Representatives of our International and National Partners, Associate Professor Dr. Hartini Saripan, Dean of the Faculty of Law of University Technology Mara, Deputy Deans, Executive Management, <laughs> Respected Flex, Honored Participants, and Fellow Students. I am Hari Sufi and I will be your MC for today. Welcome to our UN webinar series forum on international law and its impacts after a year of COVID-19. We are proud to have our distinguished Assistant General Secretary, Mr. Stephen D. Matthias, and Dr. Nilufa Moral, and moderated by Professor Dato Dr. Rahmat Muhammad to share their valuable insights with us today. To start the session, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Hartini Saripan, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, to deliver her welcoming speech and to introduce the speaker and the moderator. Without further ado, I welcome Associate Professor Dr. Hartini. Over to you, Dean. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Haris Sufi. Assalamualaikum and good morning, New York. Good afternoon, Geneva, and good evening, Malaysia. Our greetings to ASG Stephen D. Matthias, Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs, Dr. Nilufa Oral, Director of the Center for International Law, Senior Fellow of the National University of Singapore, Member of the UN International Law Commission, IUCN World Conservation Congress Elections Officer, the Honorable Professor Datuk Dr. Rahmat Muhammad, our beloved Deputy Vice Chancellor of UITM, Professor of International, International Law of UITM Law, member of the Eminent Person Group of the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, IUCN World Conservation Congress Deputy Elections Officer, Professor Christoph Anton, our visiting professor. Professor Emeritus Stephen Freeland, our external examiner, thanks to Richard Malanjum, our adjunct professor, deans and representative of the faculties, international partners and collaborators from Indonesia, Brunei, India, Ukraine and Australia, other members of the university administration, distinguished guests, members of the alumni, colleagues and students, not just from UITM Law, but from other law schools in Malaysia, as well as law schools in, uh, internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, University Technology Mara, Malaysia, I welcome everyone to the UN UITM webinar series 
international law and its impact after a year of COVID-19. Before I take the pleasure of introducing our distinguished speakers and moderator, please allow me to firstly express my gratitude to Professor Rahmat, who is also our former Dean, for bringing together such prolific and illustrious speakers live from New York and Geneva to address our topic this evening. Thank you so much, Dato. I want to also thank the organizing committee headed by Associate Professor Dr. Nurizan Rahmat for their hard work in planning and organizing this webinar. We are also very delighted to have our national and international partners this evening. Thank you to our adjunct professor, who is also the president of our alumni association, Tan Sri Richard Malanjum, our visiting professor, Prof Anton, our excellent examiner, Emeritus Professor Stephen Freeland, deans and representatives from other faculties, universities and institutions from Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, India, Ukraine and Brunei. Most of all, we are very pleased to have our colleagues and students with us this evening to participate in this global discourse. We are privileged to have our distinguished speakers and moderator to share their perspectives on this relevant and timely topic to be discussed. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, this webinar aims at improving global awareness of prevalent legal issues regarding COVID-19, particularly from the point of view of international law. After a year of going through a very challenging situation, we cannot deny that COVID-19 is a global health crisis that gives unique challenges to international law, from health and human rights to international trade and security. The pandemic raises questions that will reshape our future. At this uncertain time, expertise is more important than ever. This UN UITM webinar series proudly presented by the Faculty of Law UITM, aims to enlighten us the impact of the pandemic on international law. So we are, we are privileged to have three distinguished speakers and moderator who will be speaking and discussing this issue from the United Nations perspective. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce our speakers and moderator for this webinar. First and foremost, we have Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Stephen Matthias. And Mr. Matthias has served as Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs since 1st September 2010. In this position, Mr. Matthias is the head of the Office of the Legal Counsel and assists in the overall supervision of each of the units of the Office of Legal Affairs. Prior to his appointment as Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, he was the Director of the General Legal Division in the Office of Legal Affairs. Before joining the United Nations, he served at the United States Department for 20 years. From 1992 to 1996, Mr. Matthias was the Counselor for Legal Affairs at the United States Embassy in The Hague, where a focus of his work was the startup phase of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. From 2004 to 2007, he served as general counsel to the multinational force and observers, which supervises the implementation of the security annex to the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. Before joining the public sector, Mr. Matthias worked from 1981 to 1987 in private legal practice at Milbank, Tweed, Hartley and McCloy. He is a graduate of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and Columbia Law School. Mr. Matthias has taught as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center and is a member of the American Society of International Law, the American Law Institute, Institute and the Council of foreign relations. 
Next, we have Dr. Nilufa Oral. Dr. Oral is a member of the United Nations International Law Commission and co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. She served as a legal advisor to the Turkish Foreign Ministry for Law of the Sea and as a climate change negotiator. She is a distinguished fellow of the Law of the Sea Institute at Berkeley Law, has lectured at the Center for International Law uh, at uh, NUS, the UN Regional Law Courses for International Law and at the Road, uh, Road Academy for the Law of the Sea. Dr. Oral served on the International Union for Con Conservation of Nature, IUCN Council from 2012 to 2016, was co-chair of the IUCN Specialist Group on Ocean, o Oceans, Coasts and Coral Reefs from 2006 to 2018, and chair of the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law 2014 to 2017. And she is currently the elections officer of the IUCN World Conservation Congress. Dr. Oral is a series editor for the International Straits of the World Publications, a member of the board of editor of the European Society of International Law Series, associate editor of the research perspectives in the law of the sea. She has published numerous articles and edited several books and has spoken at numerous international conference, conferences. And last but not least, we have our honorable uh, Professor Dr. Rahman. To begin with, Dato Rahman is one of our alumni. Dato Professor Rahman is currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of UITM. He is also a Professor of International Law and is a former Dean of the Faculty of Law, UITM Malaysia. Professor Rahman was appointed as the fifth Secretary General of the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, ALCO, on 20th June 2008 at ALCO's 47th Annual Session held in New Delhi, India. He was subsequently unanimously reappointed on 18 June 2012 at ALCO's 51st Annual Session in Nigeria. During his tenure, Professor Rahmat has seen to fruition his work to revitalize the organization, as well as his work in promoting the codification, dissemination, and development of international law and ensuring Asian African participation in these processes. Apart from his diplomatic role, he delivered numerous lectures in many universities around the world and held various academic positions. He has written numerous articles, papers, reports, book chapters, and books on diverse topics on public international law. In 2016, he was nominated by the government of Malaysia as Malaysia's candidate in the 2016 election of the International Law Commission, ILC. He is currently a member of the University Group of the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, ALCO. He has been awarded with the highest honor as an academician when he was conferred the Academic Figure Award of 2019. He is currently appointed as the chairman for the National Sports Institute and also as a deputy election officer of International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, for the year 2021. Honored guest, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the speakers and moderator. With pleasure, I now present Professor Rahmat to commence the session. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, Dean Hartini. Very kind of you, very kind words. And I, I, I bid the uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
and a very good evening here in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Australia, and a very good morning to Mr. Stephen Matthias, and a very good afternoon to my dear colleague, Dr. Nilufa Ora in Geneva. Let me at the outset join Dean Hartini in welcoming our two very distinguished speakers, namely Mr. Stephen Matthias, the Assistant Secretary General of the Legal Affairs Division of the UN and Dr. Nilufa Oro, a very eminent figure of the International Law Commission, IOC, and also to all our international partners joining us now, and also our colleague, colleagues at the faculty and students. I must uh, congratulate Dean Hartini and the management team, the Faculty of Law UITF, for hosting this very important webinar. Indeed, the Faculty of Law UITM is very honored and privileged to have both speakers who are very prominent in their field of international law. I first met both of them in the UN headquarters in New York when I attended the sixth committee meeting. And as permanent observer of the UN, the organization that I've served before, ALCO, had the privilege to hold sideline meetings with both non and non member states of ALCO. And of course, uh, there I met Dr. Oro too when we were actually uh, going for our ILC election in 2016. So I think friendship goes beyond our professional duties and all three of us have been friends for many years now. And we value this friendship forever, despite sometimes we may have differing opinion and, and position. That is immaterial. I think friendship goes a long way than that. Ladies and gentlemen, I now move on the format of our webinar. Briefly, there will be three parts. The first part, I will request the speakers to make their introductory remarks and comments regarding the question that I will raise respectively. The second part will focus on specific issues. They may want to continue uh, their discussion on, you know, on the subject matter. Uh, each, each part will, will be 20 minutes, 15 or two, two to 20 minutes. And 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 uh, and and finally, the, the the third part is the question and answer session, where we will invite questions from and commentaries from from participants. So that is basically the the format of the webinar. Now, before I pass the question to Steve to Mr. Stephen Matthias, I I would like to touch briefly on on multilateralism and COVID nineteen pandemic. Now, I think COVID nineteen pandemic is a wake up call for multilateralism. But the irony is that when we push multilateralism, countries in, in their desperate attempt to cope with this deadly virus, they had imposed unprecedented measures. Closing borders is one of them. And, and we know that this is something that goes against the current International Health Regulation 2005 and, and the various infection is actually beyond borders. And we have witnessed, regardless of race, religion, whether you're rich or poor, all of us are affected by this. There is no single territory or human community that is unaffected by the invulnerable or being, being invulnerable to the spread of COVID-19. And it, it's interesting how Paolo Giordano observed this. The, the contagion known, knows no borders, nor discriminate on the basis of nationality, race, ethnicity, religion, or indeed any other ground of distinction. The danger it poses is to human life itself. And so the epidemic encourages us to think of ourselves as belonging to a collective. It pushes us to behave in a way that is unthinkable under normal circumstances, to recognize that we are inextricably connected to other people, to consider their existence and well-being in our individual choices. 
in the contagion, we rediscovered our soul as part of a single organism. In the contagion, we become again a community. Now, the fight against the pandemic requires more and enhanced international cooperation and worldwide solidarity. In our attempt to contain and counter this pandemic, an effective international cooperation, transparency, science-based approach and decisions making, and coordinated global response is dire. And when we talk about multilateralism, inevitably we like to refer to the UN as the global reference for peace, security, and humanity. Yeah, I'd like to focus on the Security Council as the guardian of peace and security as mandated under the UN Charter. In support of Secretary General Antonio Guterres' plea for a global ceasefire in time of COVID-19 pandemic, Resolution 2532 was finally approved. This is a testament of the global effort to fight against COVID-19 pandemic. The idea is to ensure global ceasefire. We, we talk about, when we talk about the resolution, the resolution demanded a general and immediate cessation of hostilities in all situations to observe a durable humanitarian pause for at least 90 consecutive days and requested the SG to provide updates to the Security Council on the UN effort to address the COVID-19 pandemic in countries in situation of armed conflict or affected by humanitarian crisis. So, Steve, your question is this. Do you think the idea of ceasefire as per the Secretary General as the Security Council Resolution 2532 is being complied with by states engaging in armed conflict? Are they being complied with? Do you think this is one occasion in our human history? Countries in armed conflict will work in solidarity to fight against COVID-19 pandemic. The floor is yours, Steve. Well, thank you very much, Ramat, for that question. And it's wonderful to see you again, my friend. And I want to thank uh, UITM and uh, Dean Hartini. And uh, it's very good to be on a panel uh, with uh, Dr. Nilifer Alfon. It's an honor to be part of this, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. The, the topic that's been identified is an interesting one, and it, it also has an element of ambiguity. It, it gives us a chance to consider what effect international law has had on COVID, and also what impact COVID has had on international law. And then there's the question uh, that Ramat has posed about what effect COVID will have on international law going forward, uh, and in some ways that may be the least clear aspect of the problem. Now, to focus initially on the Security Council, as I've been asked to do, and how the pandemic has affected its, its exercise of the responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, I think that a good place to start would be to consider how the pandemic affected the working methods of the Security Council, because if the Council can't work, then it can't maintain international peace and security. Under Article 28, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter, the Security Council is meant to be organized so as to function continuously. That has always meant that the members of the council have representatives available in New York all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for in-person meetings. But last March, when it became impossible to hold in-person meetings, it put the Security Council in a position it had not previously been in. How, how would it do its work 
if it couldn't have in-person meetings. One possibility would have been for the council to decide to have virtual meetings uh, that would have the same status as, as the in-person meetings. But the council did not uh, proceed in that way. Uh, from the council's perspective, although it has had open and closed meetings by video conference, those are not formal meetings. All those meetings have been informal. And you, the council cannot act to take decisions in informal meetings. The council can only take decisions in formal meetings, except that there is some practice of the council in taking decisions in writing by what's called correspondence. And so the Security Council from the beginning has, has met in these informal, open and closed video teleconferences and then taken decisions by correspondence in writing in exchanges of correspondence among the members. So in that way, the council has generally, I would say, been able to meet uh, its, its responsibilities, e even in situations in which it could not hold in-person meetings. Then in, in July of last year, when the situation in New York improved somewhat, it, it decided to proceed to hold some in-person meetings, but not in the Security Council chamber, which is quite, quite a small chamber to accommodate the usual 15 members, but it, it started meeting in larger UN conference rooms, which are intended for larger bodies, but so that social distancing could be maintained. And so for a number of months, it met in the trusteeship, in the, in the ECOSOC Council, uh, Economic and Social Council Chamber here in New York, uh, which was which was not ideal for its work, but was sort of tolerable to the members. Subsequently, just recently, it's returned uh, to the Security Council Chamber. Um, I think it's it's important to note, and and I'm going to mention this again later if we talk about other parts of the UN system, and in particular the General Assembly that the, the principal intergovernmental organs of the United Nations have, have chosen not to regard uh, virtual meetings as formal meetings. They have always insisted uh, that formal meetings are meetings that are held in person. Uh, and it's, they've had to develop ways to take decisions outside of uh, formal meetings, which has generally been in writing or through a silence procedure. That is where a document is circulated. And if no one objects, the document can be regarded as adopted. So on that first issue, how has the Security Council done its work during the pandemic? I would say it's changed its working methods, but it's done so in a way that enabled it to continue to uh, satisfy its responsibilities in the field of peace and security. Now, let's turn to the substance. How, how has COVID actually been addressed in the decisions of the council and what consequences had it, has it had for the council's work? Uh, Ramat mentioned Security Council Resolution 2532 of the 1st of July of last year. This was a resolution in which the council endorsed essentially uh, the proposal that the Secretary General had previously made for a global ceasefire. Uh, the, 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 the Council uh, demanded uh, a general and immediate cessation of hostilities in all situations on its agenda. The question is, how, how effective was that resolution, which has subsequently been, been followed up with resolution uh, 2565 of, of, of 2021? I, I think we would have to admit that 
that while there was a cessation of hostilities in some ongoing situations of armed conflict, uh, that has not been the case uh, in all situations of armed conflict. Uh, so, and the council has not followed up resolution uh, 2532 or resolution 2565 with uh, sort of more targeted resolutions related to ongoing situations of armed conflict. So we have seen the council in, in the broadest sense with respect to COVID uh, calling, calling for the global ceasefire and in, in, in the resolution from this year, 2565, also calling for more international cooperation with respect to COVID generally. But we haven't, we haven't seen uh, the council going beyond those general uh, statements, demands, uh, to seeking to specifically take steps to uh, end armed conflict in the cases where the hostilities have not been ceased, where there hasn't been a global ceasefire. Now, the council from, from March of last year through today has had to deal with COVID in some specific contexts. For example, it's had to, in some cases, adjust the mandate of peacekeeping operations to include assistance to the host states with respect to uh, the fight against the pandemic. Um, it's, it's made reference in a general sense to the protection of both peacekeepers and local populations from the pandemic. But I, I think if one looks at the pandemic generally during the period from March of last year to the present, one can identify perhaps three main threads in, in the Security Council decisions from that time. First, there has been there have been a, a few resolutions which are diagnostic in character. That is, they, they seek to identify the impact or the effects of the pandemic on some of the situations before the council. So, for example, presidential statement uh, uh, in 2021 on peace and security in Africa said the Security Council expresses grave concern about the devastating impact of the coronavirus disease pandemic, which has caused severe socioeconomic, political, humanitarian, and security repercussions and further exacerbated existing conflict drivers in Africa. In the presidential statement uh, in 2020, August of last year on children in armed conflict, the council noted the heightened risk for children in armed conflict of not resuming their education following school closures, particularly girls, making them more vulnerable to child labor, child recruitment, as well as forced marriage. So, in those cases, the council is saying, here are some of the effects of the, of the pandemic. Then the second thread is, in some cases, the council has identified what needs to be done. So in the presidential statement on peace and security in Africa, the council stresses the need for greater support to African countries, especially conflict-affected countries and regional and sub-regional organizations, in order to recover from the pandemic and build back better in a more just, equal, equitable, and inclusive manner, including through providing necessary medical supplies, including safe and efficacious tests, treatments, and vaccines, and supporting African countries in strengthening their health systems. So, so there, in that presidential statement, you see the council identifying a fairly important list of things that need to be done, but not, not more, simply identifying what needs to be done. Then in a few presidential statements, the council has specifically called on states, either generally or specifically to take specific actions to deal with the pandemic. So for example, in that pres presidential statement I mentioned on peace and security uh, in West Africa, 
The Council underlines the importance of international cooperation and solidarity, welcomes the efforts and contributions of UNOWAS, which is the UN Office for West Africa, the African Union, ECOWAS, and other member states, and calls for continued support and enhanced cooperation to ensure a comprehensive and inclusive response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including equal and affordable access to a vaccine, as well as essential health services, and for actions to prevent the harmful effects of the pandemic on the right of every child to education, and to support education that is inclusive, equitable, and of quality using accessible and inclusive distance learning solutions to close close the digital gap. Again, here what we see is the council looking to the African Union, ECOWAS, member states to take certain actions, in this case particularly with respect to education. There are similar provisions in other resolutions, for example, resolution uh, on the situation in, in Yemen. But I think what, what significance is, is that the council has not sought to take charge of the international response, either generally or in the case of particular countries, or to help better coordinate the responses of member states and other international organizations. And this, this is important, I think, given that the council has, has stated recently that combating the COVID-19 pandemic and sustainably recovering from it requires greater national, regional, and international cooperation and solidarity and a coordinated, inclusive, comprehensive, and global international response with the United Nations playing a key coordinating role. And, and one can contrast the position that the Council has taken here with the case of Ebola. And in that case, the Council adopted a, a, a quite lengthy resolution, uh, Resolution 21. 77 of 2014 that contained a large number of exhortations to the states directly affected, to member states in general, to other international organizations, including the WHO, and to the Secretary General. So there's also the issue of how the Council has, has characterized the pandemic as part of its own work. It has not determined, for example, that the pandemic constitutes a threat to international peace and security, uh, as it has done, for example, with the HIV uh, AIDS pandemic and the Ebola outbreak. Instead, what the Council has done with respect to COVID so far has, has been to deal with COVID as an aspect of the situations that are currently before it, whether country-specific or, or thematic, uh, just as it deals with other aspects of a situation that it regards as not specifically within its charter remit. So I think what we're seeing with respect to the council is it is seeking to, to encourage more effective uh, response by the international community to the pandemic. But it has not regarded the pandemic itself as the council's responsibility to address. And I, I think that's in large part because the UN system as a whole has looked to the World Health Organization as having the lead with respect to COVID. And the council is, is willing to, uh, to look to the WHO to exercise its responsibilities in that respect and is not seeking itself to take the lead on the international response. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you very much for the explanation. Perhaps you will continue later on uh, the General Assembly. You mentioned about General Assembly taking a more uh, effective role uh, compared to Security Council. Perhaps we will address that uh, issue later. Now, uh, back to Dr. Nilufa Ora. Now, I, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Nelofa Oral, as regard to the role of International Law Commission or the ILC. Now, has there been a significant move made by ILC to ensure its relevant and significant role in time of COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, there are, um, of course, suggestions that 
perhaps looking back at uh, the work on state responsibility, how states can be accountable, uh, more accountable in, in relation to uh, a situation like the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what do you think of, of, of that? Would you like to elaborate on, on the, the role of ILC and what uh, important move or changes that it, it has done? Uh, especially in terms of uh, 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 looking at COVID-19 pandemic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mohammed. Um, and first, may I start off by saying salam and alaikum. Um, I'm in Geneva right now. I work in Singapore, but I'm Turkish and from Turkey. So uh, I just wanted to uh, express my sincerest appreciation for this invitation. Unfortunately, virtually, uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to uh, go back at some point to seeing each other in person. Uh, so I'm very grateful, Dean uh, Saripan, for this invitation. Uh, and of course, delighted to be election officer with my dear friend and colleague, Professor Mohammed. Uh, it is a very uh, big uh, responsibility we have indeed. Um, but of course, that's another issue about the impact the pandemic has had on many large organizations and events. Um, but you've asked me today to speak about the International Law Commission. And um, so I will do that. And, and I'm not sure all, if everyone is familiar with the, the function of the International Law Commission. Um, it is actually a subsidiary body of the um, uh, UN General Assembly and it's responsible has the mandate for the progressive development of international law and its codification. Now, of course, we don't have the heavy responsibility of the Security Council for maintaining peace and security. So our role is much more modest, but it, it is a role that um, was entrusted to the commission 1947. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we celebrated the 70th anniversary. Uh, and so, the, the, the thinking, of course, was um, that the commission would be responsible for codification. And indeed, uh, over the many years, it has laid the foundation for well-known international treaties, such as the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Immunities. Um, and I understand, uh, 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 um, in fact, the area that I work in quite a bit, the Law of the Sea, the 1958 Geneva Conventions on the Law of the Sea. So it has been, um, uh, it, it, its primary role has been um, codification and progressive development. I won't get into the details about what that means. So the commission itself is composed of right now 34 experts representing the principal legal systems of the world from the five regions and they are elected. And the, the commission, it's not a permanent body. So the commission meets once, well, twice a year. Um, that's why I'm here in Geneva right now. And a total of between uh, about 11 to 12 weeks. So we meet in May, June, July, August. And the reason I'm going into a little bit of detail because it's also, I wanna talk a little bit about the working methods and how uh, the pandemic has also impacted the working methods of the commission. Uh, and so the commission has a number of topics. Um, and I know one that, um, that Professor Mohammed related or just referred to, it's probably one of the well known ones is the articles on state responsibility. Um, and though that work was adopted in 2001. Um, and so these topics are selected usually by the commission. A special rapporteur is appointed and the special rapporteur provides guidance through reports. And these reports are um, give a background on existing state practice, which is very important for identifying uh, whether codification is possible or not, or whether it's emerging state practice, existing case law. So it goes into detail. This report is important because then it comes when we meet physically, I underline, uh, in Geneva, 
that report becomes a foundation for a very intense, rigorous analysis and debate in plenary, the plenary session. And each of these reports will have some objective and outcome of some sort, which could be draft articles, conclude, we're now looking more at conclusion guidelines. And in the afternoon, there is a drafting session. This is, this, you know, drafting of, uh, um, uh, as we say, it's part of the codification progressive development. And that drafting session is done in um, uh, within a drafting committee, and there's a chairperson, a drafting chairperson. Now, the plenary is open to everyone. In fact, uh, right now, plenaries you can watch on UN Web TV if you really wanted to. Uh, but the drafting session is private because that's where that's where they say all the fun takes place, actually, <laughs> where they really tell you know you really express what you feel about certain issues. Now, the pandemic really has had an impact, of course. Uh, in 2019, we were supposed to meet and, um, and it became quite evident by March of uh, <clears throat> 2020 that we would not be able to meet. But no one really could see into the future how long this pandemic would last. I think we were still hopeful that by July we would be able to meet and that was not to be the case. Um, so we had to cancel and, and to be quite honest, you know, very technical issues. Uh, the UN requires translation, uh, simultaneous translation. And, and that applies to the International Law Commission as well. Uh, so the question was, uh, at that time, they since developed this cap capacity, but it really didn't exist then. Uh, what is, what's the status of these meetings? They can't be formal meetings you know, drafting committee. Anyway, so we didn't meet last year, but this year we are meeting. And of course, we have all learned to adapt technologically. Uh, institutions, organizations have all had to adapt, and so has the commission. And um, so we have now are operating in a hybrid fashion. So those colleagues who are unable to travel, um, they are able to participate through Zoom. And for the plenary session, that is perhaps all right. But again, one big issue, time zones. Uh, I think technology has not been able to solve the time zone gap. Uh, so it becomes quite unfair. And this is, I think, a big issue of multilateralism for international law. Because if we're going to be negotiating, um, is it fair to have you know one part of the world constantly having to get up at three or four in the morning, and the other part of the world have to stay up till one or two in the morning, and one part always gets the best, <laughs> the best hours? So these are really very real issues that impact these meetings. It impacted the commission meeting. Um, so what we were able to do is really limit our time so that uh, we meet two hours in the morning, so that our and the colleagues who are in the Americas um, send video, their video comments. And then we meet, now we've extended a little bit now, and we meet a few hours in the afternoon, and that allows uh, the Americas and, uh, and Asia to participate in the drafting session. Um, now the drafting, the plenary, it's all right to do hybrid, but the drafting session is of course uh, a little bit more challenging because these are negotiations. And, and I think we may talk about that perhaps later on, but uh, to negotiate through Zoom is quite challenging because uh, a lot of times people talk informally, they may share views. Um, so even the commission is, it, we're small, we're 34 members uh, and not everyone has been able to join, but that really has been somewhat of a challenge. And I'll just add one more thing. Normally when the commission works, we have many assistants, um, uh, you would be surprised to know standing room only, people coming and watching the international law seminar, all of this because the pandemic cannot happen. So it's really changed the dynamics as well. And I think in terms of exposing young people, young scholars, um, it's a great opportunity for them uh, to come and watch uh, the work of the commission. Now, having said that, set the stage, in terms of the work of the commission, one thing I will say that, the commission did um, do some work um, on the protection of persons in the event of disasters. And that is right now currently before the sixth committee. 
and uh, draft articles. And the idea, of course, it's uh, part of the Progressive Development of International on Codification, prepared draft articles. These are then sent to the sixth committee uh, to, to determine you know, what will be the future convention. Will they decide to work on it as a new convention or just simply shelve it or <laughs> keep it there? In which case it will be a source of, of it'll be a sort of reference source. Um, so I think it's it's time to perhaps look at that uh, work of the commission uh, in relation to the pandemic, because this is a disaster. It is a disaster event. Uh, and one of the important aspects, and I'm not saying that this work of the commission necessarily will answer all issues because there are specific issues that the pandemic has raised um, that international law right now has not answered. There are big gaps and we see those gaps, but the work of the commission uh, really had these types of disasters in mind. Um, and I think where we've seen a great uh, weakness has been in cooperation. Um, I think, as you mentioned, it, it really, and this is perhaps the you know instinct of survival, but it goes against the grain of what the duty to cooperate, uh, you talk, we're talking about state responsibility, of course. Um, there are all kinds of agreements. We look at the WTO. In addition, the trade where all the countries just closed up, we went into hoarding mass and protective equipment. And of course, what well, was this a necessity? You know, there, there, there are other uh, legal nuances to this as well. But we certainly saw the system didn't function right. Um, and it's still the vaccine vaccine is a huge issue. I know there's COVAX, but and, and it's very important, but we need to do more because there is a great disparity. Um, so the commission has already done this type of work. Uh, there's the articles of state responsibility, but that assumes that you know how to how to challenge states on that. Uh, have they breached? Um, have their actions resulted in a breach of international wrongful life? What are the responsibilities they have? But more so, I think what's important, and the commission is actually looking at this, is what can we contribute to the development of international law on this? Uh, the World Health Organization, of course, we have the um, uh, uh, health regulations, but obviously they have not lived up to the needs of this pandemic. Those regulations were adopted 2005 and to in response to the gaps that came after the SARS pandemic. But now we see that this COVID is even bigger and those health regulations are not adequate. They have some level of cooperation there, but that system hasn't worked and other aspects of it hasn't, have, hasn't worked as well. And in particular, um, in relation to uh, making sure that vaccines are available and equipment is available. So the commission, uh, in my view, um, could actually play a role in this. And I say that because the commission statute uh, does allow for um, the uh, different agencies and bodies of the UN to bring certain issues to the attention of the commission. Um, and I think that um, the commission could contribute its knowledge, its expertise in specific areas. We have some colleagues who have introduced the topic uh, to the commission. It's being considered, and these are and what we're looking at. Of course, well, you know, in what aspect can the commission contribute um, in the development of international law? And for me, again, there's so many gaps that have come up because we do have the World Health Organization, uh, and, and so it wouldn't be a, a question of supplementing, but complementing how to complement, how to work with perhaps even the World Health Organization. So I think that um, from the commission's perspective, one, we have been impacted like every other organization. Um, but second, I, uh, as the um, subsidiary body with a mandate for the codification, progressive development of international law and its codification, I would hope that the commission would have a role to play um, as part of the international system as part of the multilateral system. So I'll stop right there. Thank you, Dr. Oro. Uh, 
thank you for that uh, explanation. Perhaps we will go further on on RLC matters later. Um, Steve, uh, in relation to international cooperation, uh, we have the General Assembly. Um, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. They they had their four resolutions uh, as regard to fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, urging for international cooperation and, and solidarity. But the, the whole crux of the issue is where the law relating to uh, preparedness and responses to uh, infectious diseases is in the hand of WHO, World Health Organization being the the, the guardian of, of the current uh, uh, treaty on uh, international health regulations. And as, as, as mentioned by Dr. Oral, there is a wide gap as regard to how do you make it effective? How, for example, we work on international cooperation and cooperation and solidarity. So what is your view on, on uh, extending the role of WHO in terms of looking at other aspects of international law, for example, trade, uh, immigration, you know, migrant workers, so on and so forth. What, what is your view on this, uh, Steve? Maybe you would like to dwell on the General Assembly first, then uh, looking at WHO, perhaps. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's see, uh, I'll, a few words about the, the way the General Assembly has been able to work uh, during the pandemic, and then, and then uh, I'll try to answer the more searching question that Ramada has asked about sort of where to, how do we improve the, the international legal regime that relates to pandemics? Uh, the General Assembly uh, took an approach like that of the Security Council. That is to say that that virtual meetings do not constitute formal meetings, but informal meetings. That as a consequence of that, at least during the first part of the pandemic, uh, decisions could only be taken by consensus through the silence procedure. And the effect of that was that all 193 members of the UN essentially had a veto on any general assembly resolution through the period of uh, March through the time that the council that the general assembly began to meet in person, which was in the in the fall. Um, because of the social distancing, many fewer meetings of the assembly and its co committees could be held uh, because. It took three large conference rooms to hold a single meeting that previously could have been held in one, which meant that the, the assembly, I think, was less productive in the 75th session than it than it would normally be because uh, uh, meetings, the in-person meetings were very limited. Um, uh, just recently, uh, as I mentioned, the, the rules here in New York have changed, and it, it's now, I think, to be expected that going forward, there will be more in-person meetings. There's an in-person meeting this afternoon in which I'm participating, for example. So I think I think we're, we'll see uh, much more of that, assuming that the pandemic doesn't uh, have a, another strong wave uh, in New York. Um, Nilifer, Dr. Oral mentioned some of the important factors with respect to, uh, you know, problems with virtual meetings, especially of, of a body as large as the assembly. She mentioned the simultaneous interpretation issue initially, you know, all meetings of the assembly and its committees are meant to be simultaneously translated into the six official languages of the UN. So imagine a, a program like this, except each representative gets to choose which of the six languages he's going to listen to it in, and it, it's sort of more complicated to arrange something like that. 
There's also the issue of voting electronically, which was not accepted initially, but now there is a general assembly resolution that would permit voting electronically uh, in the event that in-person meetings become impossible again. Um, uh, Nilfer also mentioned the time zone problem, which is one that, that also uh, we're dealing with with respect to uh, virtual meetings. And, and then this issue of negotiations being more than simply faces on a screen. When you're having an in-person negotiation, you're not only having the interaction in the committee room with the speaker speaking, that part you can duplicate on the screen. But what you can't duplicate is the, uh, the conversations in the corridor and the, um, there's a, a limit to how long and in how much depth the virtual uh, proceeding can go. And, and I think the, the ILC experience that Nilifer shared is, is, is broadly relevant to, to the meetings of, of UN bodies, which is if there's in-depth analysis that will take several hours, it, it, it's going to be much more effective in a in-person setting than in a virtual or hybrid setting. At least that's been the experience so far. And so uh, I, I think we've seen that not only as uh, Nilfer mentioned with the ILC, but also with other bodies too. So um, if the General Assembly did figure out a way to carry out its business, although as I suggested, maybe not as effectively as it would have done in a normal year, it wasn't the case for some international conferences, which had to be postponed. And, and the reason there's a different approach to conferences than to meetings of the General Assembly in New York is that for the General Assembly itself, each member state has a mission in New York. So everybody who needs to be in that meeting is already in New York, and it's just a question of those people getting together. For a conference on a detailed subject, many of the experts would come from capital. And so that introduces the element of how do you get all these people into a single place? What quarantine rules would apply, et cetera. So a number of important meetings were postponed. Uh, we know about the ILC, uh, as Neil first mentioned, although this year, very fortunately, it is going forward. The UN Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, <clears throat> excuse me, had, <clears throat> had to be postponed as, <clears throat> excuse me again, as did the Inter Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biological Diversity Beyond Areas of National Jurisdiction, what we call BBNJ. Also, the UN Ocean Conference and the Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. <clears throat> I mean, for example, if we're looking at the development of new international law, this conference on biological marine diversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction is specifically negotiating a new international law agreement under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's been doing that since 2018. The fourth session was meant to be held in March or April of last year, but it's now been postponed to 2022. So that's an example of a case where treaty negotiations have been directly affected by the, the pandemic, and there are many, there are many other similar cases. Uh, and I think, as I said, that reflects the fact that member states, I think, think it's very hard to do the, the real difficult work of negotiation uh, in a virtual setting, at least so far, it's been proven difficult to do that. So when will these large international conferences be able to resume again? In, in New York, at least, it's, there are five factors that have been identified that would have to be present for conferences to take place in New York. That would be that all travel restrictions, all travel restrictions to the US are lifted, that visas are, can be processed by the host state, that flights to and from New York are operating, that hotels, food services, et cetera, are operating, 
and that the UN is open with no restrictions in terms of numbers of people and social distancing. So we're not at that stage yet for the holding, I think, of major conferences in New York, but I think we will be, we will be seeing that in time. Now, some, some of the intergovernmental bodies and some expert groups have been able to do some productive work during the pandemic. And I think I would mention uh, in this connection a couple of uh, entities that are operating with respect to cyber, cyber issues, cybersecurity issues. The ad hoc committee to elaborate a comprehensive international convention on countering the use of uh, information and communication technologies for criminal purposes uh, has, has done some useful work and will continue be continuing that work in, in the next year. Uh, there's also an open-ended working group on developments in the field of information and telecommunications in the context of international security, which has done uh, and continues to do some important work in the development uh, of the international legal regime related to cyber activities, both with respect to crime and with respect to peace and security. And I thought I'd also want to mention the uh, the UN 75th anniversary declaration uh, from, from last fall. Um, now, of course, there was meant to be a large celebration of the 75th anniversary of the UN in New York last fall that couldn't take place. But the assembly did adopt the 75th anniversary declaration. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And one aspect of that was the declaration by the members of the General Assembly that they will abide by international law and ensure justice. And the member states in that declaration have asked the Secretary General to report back to the Assembly this year on how to advance the common agenda that the Assembly has set forth in the 75th anniversary declaration, in particular with respect to international law. And that has led the Secretariat to do some work on the future of international law. And I think this ties in a little bit to the theme of this meeting, and in particular, the question that Ramat keeps, keeps, keeps trying to focus us on, which is how, how can the international community create a more effective international legal regime to deal with pandemics? And I was very heartened to hear from Nilofer that the ILC is looking into what contribution it, it can make in this respect, and that would come back to the assembly then uh, in due course, and, and hopefully something, uh, something good would come from that. I mean, we have heard during this pandemic a number of proposals for new international agreements of some kind. Uh, there has been the proposal for a new treaty on pandemics, there have been proposals for treaties on uh, deforestation, for treaties on plastics. And I think what, what is important for, for the international community in assessing all of these proposals uh, is to, to try to examine the existing legal regime. To identify the weaknesses of that regime. To determine whether the weaknesses of that regime are a result of the substantive content of the regime or a failure of implementation or enforcement. Flowing from that, if it's if it's a problem of implementation and enforcement, you don't need a new treaty. You need you need to develop capacity building more effective enforcement, H how can international organizations like the UN help states implement their treaty obligations? And uh, for example, in the, in the a couple of articles that Dr. Mohammed wrote uh, about the, the, the proposal for a pandemic treaty and about the international health regulations, I mean, he pointed out that a large part of the problem is is a failure by states to live up to their obligations under the health regulations. So, so if that's the case, you know, it, it may be that what is needed is not a focus on a new treaty, but rather a focus on 
implementation and and states because of their sovereignty they become nervous if the discussion turns to how can treaty obligations be enforced against member states that seems a bit threatening to states but i think a, a more productive avenue of inquiry may be how can organizations like the united nations assist states to develop the capacity to satisfy their treaty obligations how how can we how can we help states better do what states have obligated themselves to do and i think in this common agenda report that the secretary general will be uh, submitting to the assembly uh, later this year i think you will see a suggestion there that that we also consider as well as as gaps in the substantive legal regime that we also look at how we can better assist states uh, to satisfy the obligations they've already undertaken. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Indeed, uh, thank you for mentioning uh, the article that I've written uh, recently on the proposal of the Treaty on the Pandemic. Um, Dr. Orell, perhaps, uh, you know, you mentioned about ILC can also assist uh, in, in terms of uh, making uh, uh, the legal regime more effective. Uh, we, you mentioned about the gaps that already exist in the current uh, treaty or the International Health Regulation uh, 2005. So perhaps you would like to elaborate on on how do do, do you complement or I, how ILC can complement in, in making it more uh, effective, uh, particularly in relation to international cooperation, states' obligations towards uh, you know fulfilling the the, the the compliance, and 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 uh, and uh, do you foresee this as a, a great challenge because? much of it has been given to or mandated to WHO. Dr. No. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Rahmat. And may I say that I also want to thank Stephen. I really enjoyed listening to him and uh, seeing more in depth the challenges um, that uh, the UN Security Council General Assembly um, all have been experiencing and how collectively we're going to be able to um, tackle uh, this great challenge. And, and so the ILC, I don't want to exaggerate its role. <laughs> I think that um, uh, the role, it, it has a very specific mandate. And that mandate, um, I explained a little bit, but that mandate also, I think, allows some room to do more than what we normally have been doing, which is pick a topic, uh, meet, develop, um, debate, develop some draft outcomes, articles, guidelines, conclusions. But the statute also provides that under the UN system, the, uh, that other bodies can actually come to the present questions. And this has been done in the past, the General Assembly. Um, not always the commission has to be tasked with drafting uh, a possible treaty. But there may be specific instances, for example, some years ago, the, the question of the definition of aggression, for example. So, so I'm looking at it in a much broader way, how can the commission contribute other outside of our normal um, way of operating that's still within its mandate? Now, I say that because, of course, the, w, the WHO is the principal body, and we have to respect that. Um, it is the organization responsible for World Health or for, for global health. Um, however, um, we know that the statute does have some gaps. And I fully agree with the point that Stephen made and you have made. Um, implementation is one we have to look at that. And I and I gather now is a time to give a very um, sincere and thorough assessment of what aspects of the health regulations were really inadequate, and there are some. Um, Stephen mentioned the question of enforcement. This is the weak area um, in that regulation. And again, state sovereignty, of course, states don't like to have enforcement measures, and there's no doubt about that. 
But in this case, we saw perhaps, maybe we shouldn't call it enforcement, but some type of compliance mechanism, which is softer, um, to, to address the situation of notification. This was so critical. And um, so, so there are parts of the uh, uh, regulations, an area that I have been involved in, of course, because of law, my law of the sea work, shipping, shipping has suffered tremendously. Uh, crew have been stranded at sea for months. And the regulation, yes, regulation um, does um, adopt a human rights uh, context that, uh, that it recognizes that uh, human rights have to be respected. But what is this exactly? What does this mean? Who, at which point does this come in? Who's responsible? The International Maritime Organization was somewhat caught unprepared. Um, so you have different organizations as well. It's not just the World Health Organization. There are other organizations and there was no mechanism for coordination. So these are all aspects that I won't say the commission, though. I mean, this goes beyond the commission, uh, but within its own realm of mandates, certainly the commission can contribute, but I, I don't want to exaggerate that either. But on the other hand, um, I really feel having, you know, as a member of the commission now for a few years, I really feel that the commission could be utilized in different ways, um, that we shouldn't just be, you know, in our rooms uh, developing certain output, but under the statute, there could be a broader role for the commission tapping into its expertise. And I'm, I'm hopeful, Stephen, that actually this will be an opportunity. I can't divulge too much, but I know that certain um, efforts are being made to reach out and maybe for the commission to work a little bit differently this time, because this pandemic is a massive challenge. And unfortunately, the scientists, and we must heed to the scientists, are warning us this is not the last one. Um, so we really have to be prepared and international law is critical because it creates the framework for how states will conduct themselves. And so I think that unfortunately there is, you know, we can't find solutions just by creating a new treaty, which takes a long time. And by the time it's, you know, negotiated and it's adopted and ratified, um, but there has to be a way to really instigate action by states. But here, the Security Council, of course, is a very important body. Um, so I really thought it was very interesting what Stephen said about it hasn't yet really uh, taken ownership of this. And there may be different reasons for that. But, uh, but I think uh, this is a situation where all hands on deck, including the commission and all parts of the international community, and there's also regional uh, organizations as well. Um, so I think we really have to think innovatively as well. We have to think outside of the box a little bit, but more than more importantly, is we have a we have a genuine problem of the gap, the north south gap. It's very serious. This vaccine gap is is threatening to could be threatening to peace and security, frankly. Um, we know right now, and even uh, Rahman, with our own uh, election situation, where certain people may be excluded because they don't have the right vaccine. Yeah. So how far can we do? I mean, how much is this consistent with international law? So there's so many questions that need to be answered, and I think right now the existing framework is not adequate. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Aro. Thank you very much for the input. Now we are done with first part and second part of this webinar. We will now proceed to the third part. Now I don't have the questions. Uh, you, you see the pouring, all sort of questions are coming up and I think I will leave it to the Dean, uh, Dean Hartini to perhaps uh, highlight those questions and take up the questions and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, allow the, our eminent speaker to respond to those questions. Over to you, Dean. Thank you so much, Dato. Um, I think uh, what an enlightening session. Uh, we enjoyed it very much. And we could actually see from the number of questions that we have here in the chat box. I believe uh, Haris has actually 
helped us to take some notes on the questions. Um, Haris, uh, perhaps you could read some of the questions for our speakers to address. Over to you, Haris. Yes, thank you, Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move to our Q&A session. Professor Dato, respected speakers. It does seem that we have a lot of questions from the participants of the webinar, so allow me to read some of the questions that we can extract from the chat box. Let's start with the first question by Professor Dr. Irwin Oi. Does the ILC see any need for new international laws to deal with vaccine nationalism, which have left so many third world countries severely short of vaccines? Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much for that question. I don't think I can uh, reply speaking on behalf of the International Law Commission. As I said, well, this is a, the, the issue of the pandemic, including vaccines, is something that we are discussing and, and, and looking into within the Commission. But I can speak on behalf of myself personally that I certainly do feel <laughs> that we have to address this issue. It's a big issue. And and um, uh, it's a critical issue. Um, so I do hope that the international community um, will quickly address this. Um, and, um, and I know there are different modalities that this can be done. Right now there's the COVAX system, but it's depending on voluntary contributions. Um, and I don't know how far to go, but I'm also worried about vaccine diplomacy. Um, no country should be feeling that they're getting a handout. You know, this is a right, I think. You know, we talk about human rights. Um, so, yes, uh, personally, yes, the commission will see. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This question is from Dr. Nur Azlina Abdul Aziz. With regards to the international law, approach in governing the distribution of vaccine to developing countries, what are the approaches or policies in assuring access to vaccines? You know, the speakers would like to take up the question. Well, um, so what are the existing processes? So right now we don't have a legal framework. Uh, the UN General Assembly, and I think perhaps Stephen can speak to this, has adopted resolutions on equitable access to vaccinations. Um, there is, as I explained, the COVAX system, which is a voluntary association, states contributing, and they are contributing uh, vaccines, but it's not enough. Um, so clearly there is not a system in place to ensure that all states, I mean, I think it, it, timing is important because what we're seeing are the states who are able to afford and have access to vaccines are able to have their populations you know, vaccinated quicker than now the other states uh, who are unable to have the same access. And I don't know about you know, what happens, but there's the whole private um, aspect to this, how these contracts are negotiated, it's a whole other area, um, whether different arrangements are made. I mean, it, it becomes very complicated. Um, there's implications for, I don't know, the trade implications, but clearly this is to me a priority area that um, the international community has to address quickly, we, you know, and it shouldn't, again, I, I do take issue with a system that is based on voluntary contributors or the goodwill of certain states who happen to be, you know, fortunate enough to be able to share what they have. This should be a right for all states, uh, for all people. I mean, it really, so, so that's my, my, my very quick response to you. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Okay, uh, here's another question from uh, Associate Pro from Professor Dr. Irwin. Uh, I think this question will be best be addressed by uh, Mr. Matthias. This question reads that, what can the United Nations, especially the Security Council or General Assembly do to ensure compliance with the various climate change benchmarks? Otherwise, we may survive the pandemic only to die at the hands of Mother Nature where there is a runaway global greenhouse effect. Uh, so, Mr. Matthias, would you like to take up the question? 
Yes, thank you very much. The, the Security Council and the General Assembly are both uh, political bodies. Uh, the General Assembly uh, cannot take decisions that are binding on states. Uh, it, it essentially makes recommendations to states. Um, the Security Council can take decisions that are binding on states, but in the framework of international peace and security, uh, I think, in principle, the Security Council could determine that climate change presents a threat to international peace and security and could take decisions uh, under Chapter 7 that would be binding on states, including decisions that could uh, require uh, states to take certain actions in respect of, of some of the factors that that are contributing to climate change. Uh, but but the council could only do that if uh, nine members of the council agree and and the five permanent members of the council uh, do not veto such a resolution. I think uh, so far uh, the work on climate change has has not been taken place taking place in the Security Council but rather in a specialized body in the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC. And of course, we have this very important meeting of the, of the Conference of Parties COP26 coming up in Glasgow in the fall. Um, so I, I, I think both with respect to the pandemic and with respect to climate change, if we're thinking about UN activity, right, we, we should uh, think about the UN as a uh, the UN system as a whole, which includes not only uh, the Security Council and the General Assembly, but also the specialized agencies, right, such as the WHO, the World Health Organization, and also entities that are in a relationship with the UN other than specialized agencies like the UN uh, FCCC. So, so it, in, in, in both the cases of, of the pandemic and climate change, you're likely to see the, the, the specific specialized entity in the system dealing with the issue in the first instance. And I think it's, it, it's, it's only at a, uh, a later stage, I would guess, that the Security Council would, would become involved to the extent that it sees international peace and security as being threatened uh, in a particular case. So I think what we'd have to do is look to the, the various specialized parts of the system to make progress on both of these issues. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, we have, there's another question here. This one is uh, from one of our final year students here in UITM. Hello to all the panelists. My name is Akmar Akil, final year law student here in UITM. With what the speakers has shared, it seems that international law is faced with the issue of slow development and implementation, and the pandemic only made it worse. Could the speakers share on any steps to overcome this long stand, this uh, long standing issue, especially on enforcement, while shedding light on the delicate balance between bureaucracy, sovereignty, and the needs of the global community? Uh, I, I think this question is best to be addressed by both speakers. However, can we start with? Uh, Mr. Mr. Matthias first. Well, the question really does go to the heart of, of the discussion that we've been having. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll come back to the point I, I made uh, in, in my second intervention. I, I, I think it's true that international lawmaking has tended to be a, a, a lengthy uh, process. And uh, and I think if we look at issues of uh, implementation or enforcement, or as uh, Neela first suggested, compliance um, as a less threatening word, which I think is true. Um, it, I, I think there are some examples uh, of recent uh, international agreements, like like uh, a, a recent uh, agreement in in 
in Latin America dealing with environmental issues, where the Secretariat is given a kind of a more forward leaning role with compliance. So it seems to me what, what we should be looking toward is how to strengthen implementation compliance through, I think, capacity building. I think international organizations and parts of them, like uh, like for the UN system, we have UNDP and UNICEF. I think these entities can help states comply better with their obligations. And that seems to me to hold a potential in the short run uh, for improving compliance of obligations that already exist, while perhaps the ILC or other bodies can be considering longer term changes to the international legal framework. Thank you, Mr. Matthias. Uh, Dr. Oral, what are your views on this? Well, I have to say that um, uh, that is a big question. Um, and <laughs> And I agree with Stephen. It really is the heart of the matter, and it's a question that um, uh, I think academics and practitioners and, and, and diplomats you know, all think about in the sense of we have many, many, many uh, treaties, and and I think this is one of the great successes, of course, of the United Nations is that it has really uh, enabled a great deal of uh, treaty making, international law making, and that is really. One of its important functions, the question of, of implementation, living up to those, it's, it's, it's challenging. And I think there are, are so many different reasons for that. But on the other hand, there have been um, success, successes. Actually, there have been treaties that have been very successful. So I think that we shouldn't necessarily always look at it uh, in a negative light at all. And, and the, the example that's always given in, in and at least in international environmental law, is the uh, ozone, the ozone treaty, which did have a very strict uh, compliance enforcement uh, component to it. Um, so sometimes that does work. Um, but I do absolutely, first of all, to understand what is it that's not being abided by? And then if we're putting it in the pandemic, um, what, and that's what I'm saying, the, the health regulations have to be assessed um, and they are, I'm sure they've had meetings at the WHO. Um, and what aspects are simply gaps in the uh, regulations themselves versus implementation problems? And how can those implementation problems be um, strengthened and be uh, uh, for the next round? So we really have to understand. And, and compliance is a, is a softer term, but it's also different. And that's why I really agree with Stephen. You know, why do some states why are some states not able to fulfill their obligations? It's not because they don't want to necessarily, because they may not have the capacity. There may be many reasons for that. Um, so it's it's a big issue. It's an issue that uh, we've all been trying to uh, understand and address uh, in many ways. Um, and so we just have to keep with the pandemic has added really an, an additional challenge to it um, in terms of particularly when we start talking about access to critical medical supplies and vaccinations. Um, but on the other hand, then, you know, we don't have right now a clear um, treaty system in place for that. Uh, we have pieces of it. Uh, we have different organizations. We have different fragments. Um, of international obligations, as for international law either. But anyway, in short, what I'm saying is a complicated question, <laughs> but very important. So thank you. <laughs> Maybe you'll have to keep studying that in your, in, in perhaps continue with a PhD. <laughs> that is true. Thank you, Dr. Oral. But let's move on to the next question. This one is from Dr. Umi Hani. This is a rather interesting question. Recently, the president of Pfizer rejected the suggestion that pharmaceutical companies should relinquish the vaccine's intellectual property rights. Should the UN encourage the intellectual property rights to be shared with states to ensure all people have access to the vaccines? Now, I see that this is a very interesting question here. Let's get the views from both speakers on this as well. Can we start with Mr. Matthias? Yes, thank you. 
Well, I, I, I appreciate this question because I had intended uh, to talk about the role of the Secretary General and the Secretariat, and I, I haven't had a chance to do that so far. I mean, from the very beginning of this pandemic, the Secretary General of the UN has sought to provide leadership on, on the issues of cooperation with respect to the pandemic. Um, so should the UN encourage the IP rights uh, to be shared? It, it should and it has been doing that. I mean, the Secretariat, the Secretary General as the head of the Secretariat has been a voice of moral leadership, I think. Uh, for the, the entire international community on the issue of cooperation uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and before we had the vaccines, he was talking about cooperation uh, with respect to treatments and cooperation with respect to not closing the borders. Um, since the vaccines have been developed, he has been referring to the vaccines as global public goods that should be shared equally with all states. Um, so I think the SG has has provided you know strong moral leadership on these issues. I, I think uh, the the underlying issue of course is that that it's up to states to comply with these requests and the, this encouragement and and so far at least that hasn't been as uh, as extensive as the Secretary General would have hoped. Thank you, Mr. Matthias. Dr. Oral, your thoughts? Yes, thank you. And, and I just first would like to start off by echoing what Stephen has said. I fully agree. I think the Secretary General has taken a very clear, strong stance, uh, and, and he has shown uh, leadership in this, and, and sometimes quite very harshly as well. Uh, so, um, so I have to say that um, that is important, but it is the states ultimately. The, the states have to act. Um, now, in terms of Pfizer, um, BioNTech Pfizer, uh, it's, we know that at the uh, WTO, this was a big issue because there was a waiver clause. Um, and uh, with the new administration under President Biden, the United States uh, gave its support to actually operationalizing that waiver and um, allowing for the intellectual property rights um, that could wipe up um, uh, to, to, to be public, I guess, in terms of the vaccines. And I realize, of course, that uh, Pfizer in Germany, as well as EU, have taken a different view and they give practical reasons such as, well, you need to have people. It's not just enough to to make this public, the, the patent, but you have to have people who are able to implement it and all that. So I can't get into that detail. That goes beyond my expertise. But on the other hand, we all know that polio. You know, Dr. Salk, uh, an immortal name for all of us. He never had a patent, and today we don't have polio. Uh, so I think we really have to, you know. <laughs> There's an argument for everything, but at the end of the day, uh, we're talking about, you know, the health of humanity. Um, so this matter has to be given, um, you know, whatever the difficulties may be, at least for the pandemic, that every effort should be made to make sure that countries can make their own vaccines. Uh, this is going to be the most efficient and effective way to make sure that every person on this planet is vaccinated and not having to wait for someone to donate vaccinations to them. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Oral. We have a lot of questions, but unfortunately, let's look that uh, time is not on our side. So let's look into the last question here. This, uh, this comes from Dr. Harianto. His comments on the General Assembly. The General Assembly mostly postponed most renewal treaty. I think the general assembly also is also difficult in issuing new treaties regard, with regards to the pandemic, such as COVID-19. As we know now, each country only concentrate on handling the pandemic alone by using a few guidance from WHO. We are missing the role of the general assembly, 
since the pandemic, COVID has arisen. This comes from Dr. Imam Haryanto from the University Pembangunan National Veteran Jakarta, Indonesia. So I think this is also a good question to for us to get comments from both the speakers. Let's start with Mr. Matthias. What are your views on this, sir? Well, the the, the General Assembly, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it 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 has been challenged uh, in in the way it does business because of the pandemic. For a long period, it was not able, it was not possible to hold in-person meetings in New York. It did not have an appropriate uh, way to take decisions outside of in-person meetings uh, for most of the period. As I mentioned, uh, it could only adopt decisions outside of in-person meetings if uh, all states agreed, all 193 members agreed. Um, so, so it, I think it's true that during the pandemic, uh, the assembly, you know, has itself been affected by the pandemic, and that its effectiveness has been, has been, uh, has been to some extent impaired by the pandemic. I, I think that 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 is changing now, at least in New York, at least at this time, as the situation seems to be improving. Uh, but I don't think we should. Uh, We, we need to be mindful of the, the charter role of the assembly. Uh, the assembly can, can, can suggest the way forward for the international community. It can make recommendations to states about how they should go about their, their work. Um, but it, 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 it isn't a substitute for effective lawmaking. Uh, they're, they're, or effective compliance. Uh, and, and if we think that the problem is uh, the legal regime or compliance with the legal regime, you know, the assembly is not the answer to, the, to those problems. Those problems require uh, a different approach. I'll stop there. Oh, okay. I guess it's my turn now. Um, well, the, again, um, in terms of the, the General Assembly, um, as, as Stephen said, of course, it has a, its, its um, charter role, its mandated role. But I will say the General Assembly was early on, I mentioned earlier these resolutions for equitable access to vaccine. And I think that um, it's not a lawmaking body, it's a political body. General Assembly, but what it has been doing is, of course, raising, you know, through these resolutions, um, and I have to say also the president of the General Assembly has placed COVID very much on the priority list within the limited aspects of not being able to hold full meetings. He's been virtual, I mean, very active virtually, but I think Stephen raises a very good point that the General Assembly itself has been hampered and hindered. Uh, nonetheless, I think these resolutions are very important um, in, in raising all the issues that we're talking about. So the General Assembly is quite aware because, you know, they represent the countries who are suffering. The problem is how to take the action. And that really requires states and specific groups of states <laughs> who are capable of taking certain actions. So I, you know, I don't want to say too much, but... Um, so I will just basically agree with what with the Stephen has said and, and just highlight his resolutions again and again the role that the Secretariat has been taken and also uh, President Volkan Bosker um, as um, he's now outgoing president of the General Assembly but I think within the limited abilities he had he did as much as he could possibly uh, to raise these issues so so very good questions and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oral. And I will pass uh, the floor back to Professor Dato Rahmat for concluding remarks. Thank you, MC. I think uh, we unfortunately have to end this webinar. I know there are lots of questions in the mind of colleagues and also students, and we leave it there for the time being. Perhaps we have another occasion we can have more discussion on this. Uh, distinguished participants and um, 
eminent speakers, I think you would agree with me that this uh, webinar has been very successful, very stimulating indeed, and thought provoking. And to a certain extent, frankness, I think there is air of frankness, particularly in trying to show that we are, you know, all human and we want to solve these uh, issues as, 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 as soon as possible. And now uh, we are very much privileged to have the two very prominent speakers right from the UN headquarters in New York and Geneva. They, they, they belong to the United Nations and, and we are indeed very privileged having them with us uh, tonight. And uh, we have greatly benefited from the talk. And uh, for that, uh, Steve and uh, Nelifa, we, we must thank you both for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. And uh, to the host of the webinar, Dean Hartini and her very dedicated team, I must thank you and congratulate you for hosting this very successful webinar. And to the student, I hope you have enjoyed and gained something useful, something different. We brought you very prominent speakers, very able personalities that lead the UN. And I think this is something that you should cherish and be inspired by what they have said and, and, and what, what are their thoughts on, 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 especially on humanity. And I think you, you, you would then explore the journey of this international law and make it international law as your future career. With that, once again, uh, Steve and Melifa, I thank you very much for having having us, and uh, we hope to see you soon. And uh, stay safe and take care, and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Professor Dato. Looks like our event today has come to an end. Our webinar tonight has truly been an engaging journey. Special thanks to the guest speakers for such an informative session. We have learned so much and are truly grateful for the experience to foray into international law amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope this session has been most beneficial to all participants. And thank you to the organizing committee as well, who had worked hard for the event today. And now we will have a photography sh session shortly. To all participants can remain on the platform. We will start with a photography session, especially for the moderator, the speakers, and the dean first. I'd like to invite the esteemed guest speakers, Mr. S Mr. Stephen D. Matthias, Dr. Nilupa Oral, our moderator, Professor Dr. Rahmat, and the Dean, Dr. Hakim Saripai, for the photography session as our memento of the event. Can I get anyone from the committee to take the picture? Okay, uh, so I will take the picture for uh, the panelists first. Okay, all right. Uh, so in count on three, uh, so smile. Uh, one, two, three. Okay, all right. Okay, done with one picture. Um, should we take another one, yeah? Okay, moment. Okay, another one. One, two, three. Okay, all right. So uh, now we can take for everyone, yeah, Haris? Okay. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite all panelists to open their camera for a group photography session. Dr. Arangla, right. can you take the picture? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we are, we are still waiting for some of the panel, uh, some, some of the guests to uh, turn on their camera. Uh, Okay, yeah, they, they, they are still turning on, so we'll, we'll take another second for them all. Well, Prof Panda already. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. Um, okay, yeah, I think we can take one photo uh, for uh, all of these guests. Okay, uh, count of three. Okay, one, two, three. Smile. All right, so uh, another one for freestyle, I think. 
so well, that that's the, the norm here. We we'll take another with a free style. Uh, okay, one moment yeah. Okay, all right, free style. Okay, in, in count of three, one, two, three. Okay, all right. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, thank you, Steve. Steve. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This Goodbye, is everyone. great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Such a such an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Oro. Thank, thank you, Mr. Matthias. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.